Welcome to the vlog, y'all. As you can see, I am wearing a heart monitor right now, and I'm about to tell you why I'm wearing the heart monitor. So today is May 11th, and today I had an appointment with a cardiologist. This is the first time I've ever seen a cardiologist, and so obviously it's the first time that I've ever seen this particular cardiologist. It was through Duke, and it was a referral from my most recent gastroenterology appointment. And the reason for the referral was because I've been having these weird episodes where my heart will, for a series of hours beat really irregularly in a way that feels sort of rough in my chest. Like it feels like it's kind of surging and then slowing down. Um, it'll feel like it's just like doing all these weird things. I feel out of breath and tired when it's happening and it honestly legitimately scares me. They don't happen every day. They don't happen even every week. Sometimes they happen every week. Um, sometimes it happens more often. Just it's, it's irregular and it feels irregular in my heart when it's happening and it scares me. So that was the main reason for the referral, like me actually getting scared, but kind of the broader thing that my cardiologist and I talked about today was these incidents that I have where I have just all these sort of weird symptoms kind of at once and I've discussed it with my gastroenterologist before and they've encouraged me to see a cardiologist that a lot of times going from seated to standing um, I will feel very out of breath, dizzy, weak and going from seated to standing uh, basically my vision will kind of go black and I will feel like I'm gonna faint. Sometimes I will just kind of fall to the floor because of just how weak and disoriented and awful I feel when this happens. Um, a lot of times I'll have to go from seated to standing very, standing very slowly because of how dizzy I'll feel. And just all these kind of culminating things. Other things kind of related to that that I forgot to mention to the cardiologist is the fact that just like my blood seems to pool in my hands a lot of the time, especially if I'm walking outside in the heat and my limbs fall asleep, fall asleep and have like weird like nerve feelings all the time. That happens almost every day. My limbs will fall asleep sitting in or being in some very position. But anyway, all of these things, um, except for the last two, <laughs> I talked it with the cardiologist and he is doing the standard tests. So while I was at the cardiology office, he did the EKG, he checked my blood pressure, and he decided to do this test, which is a 24 hour heart monitor test. And he ordered a echocardiogram for a couple weeks from now. Now the blood pressure is a big thing. And when he heard my symptoms, he was already thinking about dysautonomia, but he didn't say it to me out loud until like, I talked to him a lot more. And during the appointment, he checked my blood pressure seated and standing. And he also checked my heart rate seated and standing. And the biggest standout to him was my blood pressure. So whenever I have had any doctor's appointments, almost basically for my whole life, but especially in the past year, my blood pressure is super low. And in recent months, every time that my blood pressure has been taken, it has been so low. And doctors keep saying to me, your blood pressure is really low. Whenever doctors or nurses or whoever has a blood pressure keep saying like, your blood pressure is really low. And today was no different um, when the person at the cardiology place, took my blood pressure when I was seated. It was 90 over 50, which is really low. And then my cardiologist himself wanted to see what it was when I was standing. And when I stood up, it got even lower. It went down to like 85 or 86. And yeah, he was like, okay, your blood pressure is super low. And the fact that it gets lower when you go to stand up probably explains these episodes that you have where you basically faint. It's probably because your blood pressure gets super, super low. And so he thought that that was dysautonomia, a sign of dysautonomia. He's very knowledgeable about dysautonomia because his daughter has POTS. Um, we talked about POTS a little bit. He did not think that POTS was super indicated for me because when he checked my heart rate going from seated to standing, it did not spike that much at all. Like it didn't do the tachycardia type of thing that you would expect with POTS. And personally myself, when I've had these episodes and I have checked my heart rate going from seated to standing when I feel when I feel super dizzy and sick from it, um, my heart rate is a little elevated when I've checked it myself during those bad episodes, but it hasn't been super high. Like it hasn't been up into that 130 crazy high range. Um, and so he doesn't think that POTS is indicated. Obviously we haven't done any official testing for dysautonomia, so we can't really say what type it is or whether it's POTS or not, but we did, we did talk a lot about dysautonomia during the appointment. I loved this cardiologist. I liked him more than any doctor that I've had so far in my journey. And I told him that I were, I was like, you are the first doctor to truly listen to me in a compassionate passionate and kind way and acknowledge that what I'm going through is difficult. He was just so nice and he was so freaking hilarious. Like he was telling me all these stories and things. He actually got into thinking about how the dysautonomia, if I have it, could be, which he thinks that I do, could be related to my GI issues. And he even went so far as to reenact like what my poop feels like inside me. He was like, so your poop is probably in your colon like this. I'm so dry. And I was just laughing so hard. He was really funny. 
one of the things that one of the big things that we talked about, which also indicated to him really strongly that it's probably some type of dysautonomia was the fact that for the past week or so, I have been drinking a lot of liquid IV and other electrolyte drinks. And that has massively improved all of my symptoms, like the weird heartbeat episodes and my fainting, my like having like blurred or like blacked out vision when I go to stand up, the dizziness, like that has massively improved. Also the headaches, something else that we talked about was headaches. Part of why I was taking the electrolyte drinks, or actually the only reason why I started drinking the electrolyte drinks all day, every day for the past couple of weeks is because um, I had had constant headaches all the time, every day, constant headaches, especially when I woke up in the morning and it felt like nothing I did helps the headaches and I was desperate. And so many people recommended to me that I try electrolyte drinks and they helped with the headaches, but they helped the more that I took them. So I started replacing all of my water with water that had electrolyte drink mix added to it with a lot of sodium. And that helped with my other symptoms that I was going to the cardiologist about. And so when I told him all of this, he was like that hardcore indicates, I don't know. And so he told us about like his daughter and her pots and how he knows about that. And he told me like, you need to drink as many electrolytes as possible. And then we need to do these other tests to rule out any like structural problems with the heart or anything else that would be going on. So to get back to this heart monitor, I have to wear it for 24 hours. I have these nodules here and then I have one nodule over here. And then I have this little battery pack that I have hooked onto my pants. I'm really glad that I took a shower before going to the cardiologist because I can't shower with this on. So thank goodness I showered this morning before they put this on. They put this on at 1230 and I'll be taking it off at around 1230 tomorrow. And then they're just I guess see what happens with it on. I've tried to keep my daily, my normal daily activities. Obviously I wasn't working today because I had that appointment. And then after the appointment, they took blood work and that took a super long time because of this whole issue with communication. And so they took my blood work once at one office and then sent me to another office to have it taken again, even though it didn't even take it again. So that was a whole thing. But yeah, blood work is gonna be part of it because the cardiologist ordered a lot of blood work related to my metabolism and my blood. And so when we find out about that, that'd be part of this vlog as well. But but anyway, so I've had this on since 12.30. And then additionally, I have all these instructions here about like not getting it wet, all that stuff. And then related to keeping to my activities, I had to write this little diary of my little day. <laughs> so as you can see, like waiting for blood work was a whole hour on this little diary entry. Then I had lunch, then I had nausea and vomiting. Then we walked around Target, I was nauseous. We drove home, I was nauseous. I did some chores around the house. Then I went to a friend's house. I threw up a bunch of times. Then I was with my friend and we were just sitting and talking. So I felt okay for a couple hours. Hours. Then Robert and I walked outside, which was tiring. It was really hot outside and I had blood pooling in my hands and my hands were so swollen that all of my skin on my hand was white because it was so swollen. So I put that on here because I forgot to mention to the cardiologist that so that's a symptom that I have. So I put that on here and it also happened today. So that was a good coincidence that it happened. I could put on. I couldn't believe how swollen my hand was. Like it was totally white from how swollen it was and like all splotchy. It was crazy. And then this one was worse. Then I had, then I was sitting and resting. I wrote sitting and resting and I was, but I was filming a video for you guys during this time. Um, then I had dinner and I felt really shaky when I had dinner and I did chores and dishes and I still felt shaky. And now we're here at nine o'clock. So yeah, that's been my day and my little diary. And tomorrow I will have to find some way to take this off at work in the bathroom or whatever. And then I'm going to give it to Robert and Robert is going to deliver it to the cardiology office. So anyways, you guys, I am in hour two of my two hour long fetch quest to go from home in Chapel Hill out to Garner where Linnea works to pick up her heart monitor to eventually return it to Duke Cardiology in North Durham. I have hit every city in the triangle. It's taken about two hours and I'm finally done with it. Good morning, y'all. It is May 24th and Robert and I are about to leave to go get an echocardiogram for my heart. And that is going to be the last heart test that I have to do before the follow-up with my cardiologist. We have gotten the blood test results back. We got those back really slowly because we got different blood tests back at different times, but we finally have them all back. And I can solidly say that I don't understand what the results mean at all. And I was hoping that my cardiologist might send us some sort of interpretation of them, but he hasn't. So I'm thinking that he's not going to tell us what the blood test results meant until we go see him for the follow-up. So I can't really say anything about the blood test results. As far as the halter monitor, you have this huge page of documentation of the halter monitor test, and I don't understand it that well. What I do get from it is that nothing serious was shown on the halter monitor. Like it seemed like everything was mostly fine. There were a couple of small abnormalities 
abnormalities from like my understanding of it, I don't think they're something that we need to be worried about. But we'll know a lot more whenever we get the follow-up with my cardiologist. I don't know when that follow-up is gonna be yet because we're gonna schedule the follow-up appointment with my cardiologist after we get this echo done. And my cardiologist, when I saw him, he didn't think that the echo would show that much. He was like, the echo is probably not gonna show anything. You just need to be relaxed about it. I'm sh we're just doing it to rule out anything structural with your heart. So I'm not thinking that it will show anything and I'm hoping it doesn't show anything, but we still have to do it. I don't know that much about cardiology. I'm trying to learn, but I just don't know. Anyway, we're about to head out the door. So we got home from the echo ultrasound heart test a couple hours ago. I've just been kind of chilling. I'm obviously switched to pajamas. They got us in and out quickly, but it did take about 30 minutes for the full test because they were doing, they had the ultrasound on my chest for a long time, looking at all different angles of my heart, watching it beat in different ways. And they had to do that on all different sections of my heart with this little ultrasound thing. Um, I've had ultrasounds before. Well, I've had one before, but it wasn't for my heart. Back in 2020, the first GI test that I ever got was actually an abdominal ultrasound to see if I had gallstones. So it has been about three years, almost exactly since I had an ultrasound before. But like I said, that was for my abdomen to check for gallstones. I didn't have any gallstones. So I did ask the ultrasound tech while she was doing the ultrasound because she was doing it for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so we had time to talk and stuff and so I asked her what the test was supposed to show and she said that it just shows all the valves and all the different parts of my heart, how my heart beats and then the images that she takes in the ultrasound, they measure everything. So the size of all the arteries and the valves and the different parts, which I don't know all the parts of the heart. So she said other stuff, but I don't remember it. And so they measure it all. I make sure the measurements are all good and then the cardiologist lets me know, I guess. I'm so glad it's it's over. I'm so tired of spending every single day that I have off work at the doctor's office, which is basically what I have done lately. And I have more doctor's appointments that aren't GI or cardio related. So they're not going to be in the vlog, but I have other appointments scheduled for the next couple of weeks. So I'm not going to have a real break for a while, but hopefully sometime I will. As far as what's coming up next, after my echo, I went and I scheduled the follow-up with my cardiologist and he doesn't have availability until July. So I'm not able to see him until July 12th. But honestly, I'm okay with that because if I had gotten an earlier appointment, I would have had to see one of his physician assistants instead of seeing him himself. And I would way, way rather see him himself because Robert and I like him so much and he's so knowledgeable and he knows about dysautonomia. And yeah, there are so many things that I wish I had told him during the first appointment that I just didn't think of or didn't remember that came to me after the appointment. Like the fact that my grandmother, well, I actually didn't find this out until after the appointment because I told my mom about the appointment and the dysautonomia theory. And my mom was like, oh my gosh, your grandmother got diagnosed with with, with POTS um, like years ago. And so she has to put salt in her water and she gets all these symptoms when it's hot outside. And I've known for a long time that my grandmother on my mom's side gets really sick in the heat. And she's talked before about getting so sick that she gets like stomach problems and all these different things that go on with her. And so I've known that for a while, but because I get sick in the heat, like, and because it, I just thought it was normal to feel really sick in the heat. Like, I didn't realize that it was abnormal to feel really, really sick in the heat. Um, something else that I remembered is a real throwback in my life, but when I was in elementary school, I got an EpiPen. I had an EpiPen for a really long time. I had an EpiPen all the way through high school, and it was because of what people thought was an allergy. So basically what happened is when I was in kindergarten or first grade, when we go to recess, Recess, I would come back inside from recess and be struggling to breathe and be super sweaty and clammy and super sick. And because I was struggling to breathe after being in the heat and being like a small child, like everyone thought I was allergic to something. So I remember it happening several times and I have to come in early from recess or not go to recess. And people would bring me paper towels that had cold water on them. And it was this whole thing. And so my parents got me all this allergy testing because I thought I was allergic to something outside, but they never found anything in the allergy test. And the allergy testing literally 
literally brought up nothing aside from the mango allergy that is just a skin rash that we already knew about. And so I'm not even sure if the allergy testing brought up that at that time. I don't know because the mango allergy is developed over time. So I don't even know if it brought up anything. And so then I had this EpiPen for the longest time for years and years and years that my parents had to keep current and bring with us everywhere, but we never ever had to use it. And no one ever knew what I was allergic to. And now it's occurring to me that it was probably heat that was causing all those symptoms and just no one ever knew. So yeah, finding out that, remembering that, and then finding out about my grandmother and just a lot that I wish I would have told him. So I'm glad that I'm seeing him again in July so I can give him more information about my symptoms and things that have come from my family history. So yeah, a lot of things that I deal with, I'm finding out that other people in my family in higher up generations have dealt with just to like lesser extents that I deal with them. So I'm some sort of culmination of weird genes, I guess. Um, my blood pressure was still really low today when they took my blood pressure. It was 90 over 50 again. So even all the salt water that I've been drinking, it hasn't touched the blood pressure issues. So that's interesting. Alrighty, so today is May 31st, the last day of May, and we have gotten the results of the echocardiogram. And I'm very relieved to say that it didn't really find anything. We got, again, the same thing as with the Holter monitor test. We got tons and tons of notes about the ultrasound, all the measurements they took of my heart and all the different things that the test showed. But as I said earlier in the video, I really don't know that much about cardiology. This is a lot of test results and I'm not really sure how to interpret what it all means. But given that it all, like at the end, the cardiologist said that it all looked normal. So I'm thinking that is all normal. I'm thinking that we're good. I really am looking forward to the appointment that I have with my cardiologist on July 12th to ask him questions about all the tests to make sure that I'm understanding them properly. But I would think that if anything bad showed up on the echocardiogram that my cardiologist would have messaged me or reached out to me and told me. And we basically just got the results. It looks normal. So I'm going to assume that it's all normal. Um, Both Robert and I were a little disappointed that we didn't get any photos from the ultrasound of my heart. We just got these notes about the measurements and stuff. So that is a bit of a bummer, but oh well, we get what we get. These tests were to rule out anything that could be like causing my symptoms aside from the cardiologist's theory that I have dysautonomia. And so given that the Holter monitor test didn't show anything significant, the echo didn't show anything significant, the EKG that I had in the cardiologist's office on the day of the appointment didn't show anything significant, like all that together leads us to think that what's causing my symptoms is dysautonomia and not something structural wrong with my heart or some other issue that would be, I don't know. I don't know enough about cardio to know what those chests, those tests showing something would mean. I really don't. It's kind of a bummer. Like I put all of my energy into studying gastrointestinal stuff and my knowledge about cardio is so low. But anyway, um, I'm going to ask my cardiologist at the follow-up appointment if he thinks we should do testing to figure out what type of dysautonomia I have. Like if I have POTS or if it's a different type of dysautonomia and that'll be a separate vlog and I'll take you along with me to that appointment and let you know what comes of it. Although given that I'm managing my symptoms really well by massively increasing my salt intake and drinking salt water all day, every day, like I have had so many less weird feelings in my chest. I have had so much less fainting, so much less dizziness upon standing. I still have a lot of blood pooling in my hands when Robert and I go on our nightly walks because it is warm outside. And so I have noticed that. And there are definitely still times where I get dizzy or do faint when I stand or things like that, but it's just so much less than it was prior to the salt water and increasing my salt intake. So if it's well managed, I'm not sure that I need additional tests, but that'll be something that my cardiologist and I will talk about in about a month and a half. So I will talk to y'all in a month and a half about what happens with the cardiologist. Thank you for watching. And I hope this video was helpful and providing some insight about what it's like to go through the typical tests that a cardiologist will give to most people if they come in with symptoms such as I had. So anyway, have a great day, y'all.